Ladies and gentlemen, friends and uh, fellow travelers, good morning. Thank you so much for joining uh, this morning's uh, conversation. And many, many thanks to our speakers, uh, Momoyo Kajima of uh, Atelier Bauwau, Luc Deleu, Henri Sala, and Stephen Willits. We're very grateful that you all uh, came here to Basel today. And um, the panel today will focus on the artists uh, in relation to the urbanists, artists as urbanists, um, production of reality in terms of art in connection to the city. Um, this is uh, the second panel of a new series of panels where we are investigating different forms of art practices and uh, its panels always artists talking uh, and it sort of started last year. Um, it replaced a panel which we've been doing for 10 years with our Basel and our Basel Miami, which was about the future of the museum in all kinds of different uh, geographies, and which has come to a conclusion uh, last year. The trigger for today's panel, um, different kind of triggers, I must say. One thing, certainly, the observation that uh, we have more and more of the world's urban population actually outnumber the rural population, um, and uh, uh, that is just about to happen. Uh, the UN predicts that actually the number of uh, uh, dwellers will even double in the next uh, 30 years. Um, and it will even lead to the fact that the um, uh, world slum will actually become the primary habitat of mankind, uh, as we could read uh, in The Guardian. So more and more people are moving uh, to the city. Um, and that obviously makes the city as a topic more urgent than ever. The concrete trigger for the panel today is the extraordinary book of Atelier Bauwau called Behaviorology, uh, which looks at uh, studies of behavior and the city. To quote um, from this book, behaviorology is an independently organized discipline featuring the natural science of behavior. Behaviorologists study the functional relations between behavior and its independent variables in the behavior determining environment. Behaviorological accounts are based on the behavioral capacity of the species the personal history of the behaving organism, and the current physical and social environment in which behavior occurs. Behaviorologists discover the natural laws governing behavior. They then develop beneficial behavior engineering technologies applicable to behavior related concerns in all fields, including child rearing, education, employment, entertainment, government, law, marketing, medicine, self-management, and architecture. It was kind of interesting that at the same time I discovered this book of Bao Wow, I also read Stephen Willits' writings, because we did a long interview with Stephen, actually two long interviews with Stephen um, in London. Uh, and Stephen's book, The Artist as an Instigator of Changes in Social Cognition and Behavior. At the same time, I had ongoing long conversations with Henri Sala about his project in relation to Tirana, his very close uh, collaboration, actually, with the mayor of Tirana, Eddie Rama, um, and him as an artist producing reality in Tirana. And all of a sudden, I remembered that 20 years ago, I had visited once in Belgium the studio of Luc Deleu, and that we had the most fascinating conversation um, about him as an urbanist and his whole ideas, actually, of um, um, uh, basically producing reality in cities, all his proposals. It's a very long list the proposal for full decentralization, the proposal to stop using the lighting, the proposal to create avenues of fruit trees, the proposal for a conversion to 12 volts, et cetera, et cetera. We'll come to all of that later. So that's a little bit the story of how, of how this panel today came together. And I'd like now to invite our first speaker, um, uh, Momoyo Kajima of Bauau, wow, uh, to tell us about Bauau's wow vision of the, of the city. Um, we met with Momoyo when I came to Japan for the first time in the mid-90s for the research of a show, Wuhan Ru and I did Cities on the Move. Uh, and in our very first meeting, discussed actually their kind of vision of uh, interventionism, so as to say, in the city. Uh, the partnership was founded in 1992 between Momoyo, Kajima, and Yoshiharu Tsukamoto, uh, and has then, since then evolved in many different ramifications urbanism, uh, building of many houses, um, and of course also the books, Pet Architecture, Made in Tokyo, are just two examples of the many, many publications which preceded their manifesto book, Behaviorology, which I quoted uh, initially. Uh, a very, very warm welcome to Momoyo Kajima. Thank you. Uh, um, 
So thank you for uh, thank you for inviting me to have a com give the uh, conversation with the all and then um, the for my uh, my for a three so the what is a, a city and what is the environment of the city um, that means <coughs> my we are architect and then we are also the my, uh, participant of uh, urban space and then I think uh, in that point um, we wanted to uh, see that what's happened in the urban situation and uh, actually so in Tokyo uh, I was growing up in Tokyo and then Tokyo uh, was very so expanded uh, in economical growth and after World War II so the changeable city is uh, one of the my uh, urban situation uh, opinion, and then uh, from that point of view. So uh, at first, the uh, 1992. So I would like to try to find out what's happened after the, this situation, and then that's why uh, I choose uh, several building, uh, the very interesting characteristic building, uh, as a made in Tokyo typology. <coughs> and then typology is also the very important point of the behaviorology uh, because um, Tokyo have uh, many typology and uh, it were the, they are changing the, from different situation because for example the one single house is uh, the time my life life of the one single house is uh, for example in Japan is the 26 years old. So that means to compare from the European uh, lifespan, for example, in England, 140 years, <laughs> or Switzerland, maybe 200 years. So the compare from that uh, lifespan, so the Tokyo uh, house is very short. So that means uh, that in uh, 100 years, the it was uh, replaced uh, three times. So the um, that kind of changeable situation is very clear to find out uh, what city going on. And then maybe for example metabolisms or the recently we published the one idea is uh, void metabolisms that could happen uh, this kind of changeable situation. And um, so that means um, behaviorology, my one idea is coming from that the how the building of city itself is uh, moving or changing. So the <coughs> our typology uh, is uh, uh, kind of um, changing the character, uh, changing the uh, situation, uh, analysis, uh, uh, way of st my kind of strategy of this analysis. <coughs> and, um, and about the city, so what we try to do recently. Also another idea is that we observe the people behavior. Um, how people have a, a good time in the city or outside of the city, um, uh, exterior space of the city. Um, so uh, we try to, uh, for example, in art, Bainiari or Atriyanare, the Atelier Baba tried to propose uh, some micro public space. The micro public space means uh, um, a kind of uh, collection of the small public space. And then, uh, for example, now we have uh, one table and uh, collect, um, uh, one giving the some sort of small public, I don't know, small public <laughs> meeting. <laughs> and then it, if uh, we can have uh, some several table set, so that means uh, uh, clouds of the public space. And then, uh, each city has a different type of the public space, and uh, we try to observe uh, the, uh, what is the character of the public space for each city, and then we try to replace or sometimes activate these public space to be more library. And then, <coughs> so our um, art, the installation, uh, for example, uh, Rockscape in uh, Liverpool, Bainiale, or Mm, some other uh, no, public space idea is coming from <coughs> the, this idea. And uh, so that, that from these two uh, typological idea and also the micro public uh, space idea, so recently Atelier uh, Bauer tried to find a uh, way to propose the people 
um, to give the nicer or better or uh, thinking the what is a, a future a public space for the society. Um, and also the act if the uh, people well, architecture is always very uh, good to uh, construct the society too. So. For example, I think a church sometimes, in European church, it was built by the many people and also sometimes the political reason. <laughs> but also the, the people uh, uh, donate the money uh, to uh, give the, the new buildings or something like. So but in, in Japan also, the, for example, temple uh, is happening is like this kind of background, the donation from the uh, people and the village. Uh, to uh, build the new uh, building for the uh, temple. So something like, so but the recently after World War II, so <coughs> uh, in Japan is a uh, building is a very so separated from the people's motivation, the peop society um, needs of the people or wish of the people. <coughs> so. Um, now that we, um, our, in our intention is how people can uh, meet again the happy, <laughs> happy framework for building or happy framework of the uh, public space. So the recently, the, um, this is uh, only in Japanese <laughs> things, but the, now we try to make a, a station plaza uh, in a very so suburban area in the out of the Tokyo. Um, the original so station plaza was just a traffic uh, place for the car traffic. But uh, the city mayor and the people that wanted to have uh, some new uh, square for making the uh, people's activities. And um, normally the government uh, or city uh, couldn't find a way to discuss with the people uh, to make uh, this kind of uh, new plaza. And then the we are invited to this kind of uh, activities and also discussions. And then we are kind of facilitator to uh, discuss and uh, propose and uh, thinking the for the future uh, my public space. And then <coughs> my, my we started to this uh, project from uh, uh, four years ago. Uh, four years ago it, it started, and then uh, it will be happen uh, next year. And then <coughs> and after maybe so we observe and we watch that what's happened in the next in the future in the ten years and the next to ten to twenty years. And um, but this kind of things is. Uh, it's very small role, not so big role <laughs> uh, as an architect, but uh, uh, it's very really so for us. It's now very important to what we can do for the people that in society. So that is that is answer. <laughs> Thank you so much. I mean, one thing, Momoya, I wanted to ask you is maybe to explain to us a little bit more about the void. Uh, metabolism, because uh, Rem Collins and I have made this very long research over the last seven years, which has a lot to do also with kind of idea of uh, biological architecture and the whole idea of the metabolist movement in Japan mm. in the 60s. Uh, we wanted to map an, an architectural movement where all the protagonists were still alive. I mean, Kurokawa now passed away, but mm. when we did the research a couple of years ago, we could still interview all the members of metabolism. Um, and that book is about to come out, and now I read this week that you propose a different kind of metabolism. Mm. You are in agreement that this sort of whole ecological, biological understanding is relevant, um, but you say it isn't a core metabolism, it is a void metabolism for the 21st century. It would be great to hear a little bit more about that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, so the um, void, uh, void metabolism is, is uh, different from the metabolism is um, the vo original metabolism is uh, we call the core metabolisms. The core means a uh, lot of metabolist group that proposes uh, given that first to build the uh, infrastructure and the plug to the, the people's space to plug into this uh, so infrastructure branch or uh, main core, but actually uh, the, it, it, they thought the city would be happen more uh, vertical way, but 
Ma Tokyo uh, were already, uh, the land were uh, privatized, uh, and then also the situation, uh, for example, train or uh, subway or s bomb so that kind of so already expanded the horizontally. So that means um, the city is, uh, itself is uh, growing that a horizontal way. So that means uh, the, there is no core, they just give a lot of small building, and then we can find a, a void in between. So that's why so the compare from the metabolisms uh, we call the, our metabolism is uh, reality is a void metabolisms. And then the void, uh, in the void, there is a lot of things happen. For example, the people uh, be behave, uh, for example, dry, dry or, or dry clothes, <laughs> or vegetation, or uh, this, the void space could be uh, more a kind of common space or kind of public space. And then, and then in that sense, uh, uh, void coming from the after of the main building, but uh, the idea of the void metabolism as an urban situation is uh, we have to think, we wanted to think about the from the void uh, that first, and then to connect more uh, the each buildings. So, yes. Great, and that leads us right away to our next speaker, uh, to Luc Deleu, whose uh, idea of urban space, uh, very much also in a relation to Buckminster Fuller, um, uh, connects to ecology. Um, uh, Luc Deleu is a Belgian architect, urbanist, and artist who um, has uh, ever since the late 60s actually um, developed uh, schemes and proposals uh, for the city. Uh, he created his own office, TOP, Turn On Planning, in 73, um, where he actually pointed at the urgent need to rethink the way habitation uh, is built. Um, he then also uh, developed uh, urbanism and many different projects, uh, scale and perspective in inadapted city. It's called Ville Inadapté, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and in 2006, he launched a new project called Urban Space, which uh, has actually to do with Le Corbusier uh, and urban density. Uh, as far as I understand, a very important project is under the way right now with Walter Davids, where actually yeah. uh, a retrospective and also a, a show and a big book of Luc Deleu um, is planned, uh, which will gather for the first time all these many, many urban proposals. A very warm welcome to Luc Deleu. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Mm. Maybe I have to try to uh, explain why I became what I became. Uh, there is a, a, a very important thing. Uh, two days after I received my diploma as an architect, uh, the first man landed on the moon. And for me, it was very important because at that moment, I understood that we all live on the planet Earth spaceship earth and what's for me very important in that idea of spaceship earth the term comes from uh, Buckminster Fuller is the solidarity we are all on the same ship and we have to to take care of that ship and from there on the idea of urban space uh, came to me and I understood that thinking let's say in the modernist uh, focused very much on the city, on urbanism. And at that time I thought, yeah, maybe urban thinking is too small. It became, is becoming too small, and we have to think about urban, the whole world about urban space. Not that uh, I wanted to design the whole world, it's impossible, of course, but uh, the idea that we have always to, do, to have in our mind the scale of the earth. I think for architecture or for urbanism, there are two scales. Uh, the, the, the smallest scale is the human being, the individual, and the biggest scale up to now is the earth. We have to be aware when we are constructing that uh, the copper comes from 
Chile, uh, the nickel come from uh, New Caledonia, the plastics come from petrol, uh, from uh, the seas all over the world, and so on, and so on, and so on. So we are all, as individuals, we are responsible for the earth. That's the, the basic idea. And so, in fact, when I uh, received the invitation, uh, artist as uh, urbanist, uh, for me it's uh, rather uh, urbanist as uh, artist uh, because I thought at that moment, and I think it's still that, uh, as an urbanist you have to uh, go further than the platform of architecture and urbanism because uh, at that time uh, the platform of urbanism was very conservative um, and I, th I think when uh, we have to develop uh, new ways of living, new ways, uh, new ways of building, uh, we have that to do on a theoretical way. And uh, I understood that uh, the artistic platform was much um, opener than architecture and urbanism. Today, it's a little, it became a little bit uh, more open also in uh, the uh, architectural platform. So uh, uh, I tried always to uh, develop ideas about uh, uh, urban space about the earth, uh, urbanism, but always uh, with the scale of the earth behind. Um, <clears throat> so from uh, 1995 until uh, 2003, I think, uh, we developed uh, the unadapted city. Uh, the unadapted city uh, was an uh, idea based on uh, what makes a place to a city? What, in fact, what is the program of a city? And we started to develop a program of the city, and uh, very soon I became aware that it is impossible. Every program of the city is unadapted. That's why we always uh, work in the cities. And th therefore, the title, the unadapted city. Uh, and it's very nice also because once you think uh, every program for every act in the city is unadapted, you become very free because it's always unadapted and it's always open for critics. And that's uh, after yeah, uh, nine years uh, we uh, <coughs> ended the unadapted city and um, where we have to think uh, with the office on new thing to develop, and uh, at that moment we became aware in, in the office that the unadapted city, in fact, was uh, thinking about uh, public space, but on a uh, functional way. So therefore, we thought maybe now we have to think really about uh, the public space, and so we developed the next project that is still uh, uh, going on urban space. And the idea of urban space is uh, that well, at the end I hope to make a model, a model without scale. You see the model and some people could think, oh, it's uh, a model of a supermarket. Uh, other people could think, oh, it's a model of a city. And, or, but it can also be uh, uh, a model of a region. That's the idea, and uh, that's not a new idea, but it's uh, thinking about uh, the, the city and the earth as a, as a network uh, with knots and lines. Uh, and in fact, the unadapted city uh, that we uh, understood later on were a design of the lines, and now we are uh, uh, thinking about the knots. And when I say, uh, um, uh, scalars, then I, I think, uh, for example, that cities in the network, cities are the forums of a region, of a country, but I, I, I uh, 
speak uh, better about regions because uh, that's not uh, nationalism. Uh, and that's we are developing now. Uh, I think, yeah, I stop here. We can talk it later on. And maybe one more one question before yeah. I can then we can then address all the other questions in the discussion. But one thing I wanted to ask you to tell us is maybe a little bit more about your your office, your bureau, yeah. um, because one of the things which I find so fascinating is that uh, actually lots of architects who are not architects but who sort of people who just have a vision of what they want to build obviously can't build it because they don't have an mm -hmm. architecture office. And you at some point uh, proclaimed a do-it-yourself architecture that really everybody. Uh, can do their building just by going through your office. Can you explain to us how this exactly works? The sort of whole idea that yeah. your office is kind of architecture and urbanism for all. Yeah, um, yeah I, first of all, um, and that's also during my studies that I became aware that it's a little bit stupid uh, that in the Western world um, governments think that people can't construct anymore that they need an architect who says to them how to live. Uh, I think uh, every individual can uh, organize his, his own dwelling. And uh, individuals uh, have a very small impact on the earth. It's our uh, uh, constructions who, are, uh, very, uh, who have a very important impact on the earth. So therefore, with the office, uh, we decided, uh, first of all, houses. Uh, I, I, I put my uh, signature uh, maybe uh, 200 times under designs of houses of people like that. They made the design, and I signed it so they could go to uh, the government to uh, obtain the authorization. Because I have the idea that dwelling is free. It's only when construction, uh, big uh, 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 firms start to construct big buildings, that the impact is uh, very important on the city and on the earth. And therefore, it's clear that uh, uh, we need uh, more rules, even more rules than today, I think. But for the individual, I think uh, living is free. I hope so. And living is free leads us straight away to Tirana um, and to um, our next speaker. Many, many things, thanks to Luc. Uh, to our next speaker, to Henri Sala. Um, Henri, when we met for the first time, I think it was 2000 or 99, so the turn of the year 99 to 2000, you talked from the very beginning about the city, and the city has always played a very important role. You're born uh, in Tirana. Uh, Andre's collaboration with the now mayor, Eddie Rama, started very, very early. He was a mentor uh, to you, and uh, obviously an artist, now termed mayor. Um, and uh, many years after your first meeting, the extraordinary project which led to your video piece, Dummy Colori, uh, became a reality, where actually the mayor had invited um, uh, color back into the city, uh, a project I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, which very much, as uh, uh, Bruno Taut said earlier, in the 20th century, when he sort of protested against the idea that modern architecture would only be white, wanted to bring again color back. At the beginning, the mayor drew it all themselves. Uh, you documented, followed this whole process, and little by little, more and more uh, people got involved, and also other artists got involved, and it became actually also a curatorial project for the Tirana Biennale, where all of a sudden the city um, basically uh, was curated. Um, uh, the city has played a big role in many of your other projects. If you think about no Formula One, no cry, where all of a sudden sound uh, enters the city. So many projects uh, uh, of Henri Sala regarding the city. A very warm welcome to Henri Sala. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'll show some images from, from the, the, the color impacts and the color presence in Tirana, but before I wanted to plug in, so to say, what I'm just, what I'm going to say with what I heard from the other participants, uh, this idea of plugging to avoid. Um, uh, what happened in Tirana after the, the 90s, when it was still, um, just after the, the, the change and the fall of the communist regime, 
is that it was a city of 250,000 inhabitants, and in the last 15 years, the, the, its population has tripled. Therefore, it was based on an urbanism which was, uh, which was neat, so to say, with a, with a lot of uh, void, with a lot of empty space. And what happened after, there was a lot of uh, possibilities and desires, especially, to fill in this void. And at the same time, while a new void was created, which was the people leaving this um, system, they did not feel any more part of a commonness. So at the same time that they started filling the existing void from the inside by expanding their living spaces, uh, they started, they started um, also voiding what was supposed, what was thought before to be as, as, a, as, a, as a being together. Uh, for example, the first image that I'll show that you see, it's, uh, it's a building which stuck between... Mm -hmm. Could we have the, the... It's... Uh, I'll open it all, but it's a building which before it used to be a street. Uh, therefore, it looks like a higher bid in between two buildings, but it used to be two buildings with a street in the middle. And obviously what was left, what you don't see down, is just the, the, the place for people and for, for the cars. And it happened as each neighbor from both uh, uh, neighboring buildings, they each decided to expand their, their living space, and this brought into a building uh, to replace the, the, the street. In 2000... So So in 2002, Edi Rama became a mayor of uh, the mayor of Tirana, and he started this project, which he first applied his own ideas about bringing color to the city, uh, which was quite run down um, and was suffering even more after this expanding of the of the of the of the needs of everybody living inside these buildings. Uh, in the very beginning, as the color started to appear in the city, there was a very strong reaction to it. The reaction was from uh, like all the all the sides and range. It was from very positive to, to negative to be people being uh, interested, people being puzzled. Due to that reaction, um, he made a, a poll uh, just after only the first buildings were completed where he asked people two questions. The first question was, do you like this? And the second question was, do you want this to continue? The answers to the first questions were 65% uh, of the people, 60, 65, they liked it, and the others, they didn't like it, while the answer to the second question was 90% of the people wanted it to continue, and only 10% of the people did not like it to continue. That was uh, what I found the most interesting thing, because uh, what is this 30% of the people that do not like what they see and they yet want it to continue? I think this is what in this idea of the urbanism uh, makes for this void between what is useful and what affects the lives of the people. Um, and that was also the start of my interest in his project. Then I, I worked on this film, Dami Colori, which in a way does not document but tries to tries to um, to make visual what is not visual in color in a way so what is this political aspect of the color that is there not because it's useful but because sometimes it can be more um, it can be more efficient than, than things that are useful um, and also how color did not play in the city in the beginning like a makeup, but it played like an organ. Like it really started to re-regulate the relations between the people and make people interested in the outdoor again. Like what suffered a lot after the 90s is that people found uh, and, uh, and made better the comfort indoor, but with the full, um, the full crossing of what was to be the common space from the outside. I think this is what color accelerated in a, in a very short time, what probably would have taken much longer time. It accelerated what infrastructure would later build, which would be like, uh, like the, the, the pipes or the, the greening of the city, everything which only came later since it takes longer time and since it was much more expensive to, to build. At one point I asked uh, uh, when there was the Tirana Biennial and together with Hans Hurik, we thought it would be nice to curate a part of the Biennial where instead of 
participating with the artists inside the walls, it would be nice to ask the mayor, Edi Rama, if he could, uh, if he could open the project to other artists. So we invited among the four first artists, that's what the images you see, this is the, the project from Liam Gillick. In the beginning you'll see the project, the building, which as it was before, and then the project of the artist, and then the, build, the, the project once applied in the building. Um, in the next one, I think you can read. So the next one is a project from Olafur Eliasson and later to follow by a project from uh, Rikrit Tiravanija um, and uh, Dominique Gonzalez Foster. This was started again in 2009 with new project which came in from Ku Junga, from Olaf or Eliasson again, and other projects which hopefully will happen um, again. I think the moment that these projects came in, this starts to deal with this 30% because the, the it's not anymore about it's not anymore about the uh, just the people who 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 like it to continue and who like it, but it's also about the people who like it to continue but did not like what they are seeing yet. And I think this is the moment when we go more into into a normal city with all the the the, the where the excitement is not anymore in the in the big gestures, but it's in the in the in the little responses, which sometimes can get, can get bigger. Um, this is the the new project from Olafur, which is being uh, which is not yet which is being uh, done as, as I speak in Tirana. And there's a project of Karsten Holler which has not yet happened. Um, I think this is it. For <coughs> Thank you so much, Anri. Maybe one thing I wanted to ask you to tell us about is um, a more recent experience. I mean, this is obviously ongoing, so there is a lot of recent uh, projects in it. Uh, but a, a recent experience in Bordeaux, because I thought that was also a very interesting way of engaging uh, with the city. I saw the piece for the first time in, in, uh, in Sao Paulo, where all of a sudden in the Biennale, in the Niemeyer building, it developed a very eerie site specificity. It's almost as if it had been done there, but you had really worked in Bordeaux uh, with an abandoned building, which somehow became a musical instrument. Can you tell us about, about this experience? Yeah, this building was a, it was a very important uh, uh, concert hall and venue for, for punk and rock music in France. And it's, it's a very beautiful building which is in one of these um, difficult neighborhoods, so it's not even the center of Bordeaux. And when I discovered it, I was at the same time um, intrigued by the beauty of the building, but also the fact that such a building was closed in the 90s because of the presence of asbestos. It was clean, but it was never reopened again. Um, my idea was how a building which was inhabited from within, uh, how one could, could inhabit it again, but no, no longer really from within, and create a kind of a, of a new stereo. A new stereo in the sense that it would be, in, it would be activated again by private gestures, would be outside the building, and then the building would be like the amplifier of these gestures. Uh, to, to put it a little bit in a more like clear, um, to give a clear idea of it, like the building remains uh, vacant and, and, and bricked up and, and closed. But what I did is that I invited two people, an organ player and also um, somebody else would play like a music box and we, I produced scores, musical scores uh, for, the, for the barrel organ playing Should I Stay or Should I Go of The Clash who had been playing in Bordeaux as well as uh, produced a music box which plays Should I Stay or Should I Go of The Clash. Each of them, they are both instruments, they are, so say, old instruments, but they, each of them has a different syntax to play music, so although they are both playing the same song, they are two different versions of the song. So in a way, it's also two different memories of, of the same. Um, what happens is that uh, as the two, as the uh, organ player is going around the building as well as a, a guy with the music with the shoe box and inside there is a music box in it and it's playing this very little private gesture is being played at the same time by the building because there is a, a mic inside and there is an antenna inside the building so whatever is being played the, 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 the least movement of the hand provokes like it makes it like a public music so this was the, the um, in the beginning it exists like a performance so people were, the, the visitors, they were in between a big building, that's what they thought was 
the only thing to hear and see in the beginning, like a big speaker in the, in the city. But then as they are waiting there, suddenly they would see uh, somebody with an organ passing by and singing exactly what they were listening to. And this was creating this uneven stereo, which I'm also interested in, with a, where stereo is not, is, is, uh, is not about to bring even a larger volume to the same thing, but is to enter in contradiction with itself. Thank you very much, Henri. And this project in a difficult uh, neighborhood in, uh, in Bordeaux leads us right away to our next speaker, to Stephen Village, who has pioneered many, many projects in relation to, uh, to the city. Um, as I mentioned initially, it was actually his text, such as the artist as an instigator of change in social mission and behavior, which was very much a trigger uh, for this panel uh, here today. Stephen has been uh, pioneering artwork ever since uh, the early uh, 60s, even late 50s. Uh, and it's very fascinating if one reads his collected writings, which uh, partially have been translated into German in this book, uh, Texts for Architecture. Uh, one can see actually very early in the work, already in the 50s, a fascination for, for the city, a fascination for these new housing projects which started in England uh, after the war in an extremely still dark moment in England, which seemed great signs uh, of optimism, and then across sort of living with practical realities, more and more one can see in the text uh, Stephen's uh, rising kind of counter, what he calls a counter uh, consciousness. A very warm welcome to Stephen Willits. Okay, <laughs> Okay. well, uh, I come to this discussion really I, from hearing what I've uh, been taught, what's been discussed at the moment. I think really from quite a different direction altogether. I'm an artist and here I am living in, the, in, the, uh, in this moment in time in London and uh, I'm really thinking about the meaning of my practice as an artist and the world I'm in and uh, the sort of reality that I'm encountering and the future of that reality, how it's evolving and changing. Now this has been a preoccupation of mine going right back. I think really 1958, <laughs> while I was working in an art gallery in London, I had a fundamental realization, was that I realized that it wasn't the artist that was important, it was the audience. Because without an audience, there was no artist. So immediately, I saw that there was an interrelationship between people, society. The artist, art practice was a product of society. You couldn't divorce it from that. And I'm looking for the meaning of my practice in society. What society am I in? I'm in the social world of urban society. Uh, that's the reality I'm in. Also, I wanted to look for, to sort of look at the functionality of my practice in that world and um, I looked around and I saw that, in a way, most art that uh, I encountered was descriptive. It amplified, uh, projected, reinforced existing norms and values. This I saw was, <laughs> and also I saw that most art was old. 99.9% .9 of art was past, was, was in concern with the past. And I saw that the fundamental creative act was the act of transformation. When the man found the stick and he made a tool, he made a transformation from one thing into another. He changed the language of reality from one thing into another. It's what I, it's what I call change the level of resolution. So, in a way, I saw this act of transformation was uh, the, uh, the gave an instigatory kind of function, in a way. Um, I mean, the act of transformation, this, the role of uh, changing the way the norms and values, the way we see reality, in a way, was a much harder road to hoe as an artist. Very bumpy. But um, nevertheless, I saw that this was the way forward into providing a vision of the future. And 
the world that I was in was, as I just said, this urban reality, and I saw that most people lived in suburbia. And immediately I saw that uh, what was important here in this defining this relationship would be the language of the audience. So instead of um, the, uh, the, the uh, audience uh, acquiring the language of the artist, the language used was that of the audience. These were all early sort of ideas. But when we're all sitting here at the moment, I think we should sort of acknowledge, you know, we could, if we think about it, we're living in a kind of revolution. But it's an unheralded revolution. And it's a revolution that owes its origins right back to the early, late 1950s, early 60s, with developments in the uh, philosophical thinking about uh, the way we approach the future of reality. Uh, what, what comes from this, and you think about it, it's there present in everyday life. We're beginning to feel maybe that the world we live in is complex. It's fluid, it's transient, it's relative. These are all important ideas which a uh, hundred years ago were the world we were looking at was simple. We're moving so that um, it's what I call last century thinking, the world of objects. And this uh, fundamental acknowledgement in the late 50s of art and society made me realize that uh, that it was actually the complexity of people what, that was important. Uh, but the artwork itself was just a tool between people. It was just a sort of channel. And uh, what was uh, ultimately important was the insight, the cognitive uh, transformations that were made by the, you know, the, the, the person you were in a relationship with. So uh, I... Um, uh, this led to um, a, a practice in the late 60s, early 70s, and still continuing, I'm very much continuing now, uh, where, in a way, the idea of the artist as a, um, as object is, uh, is, is uh, di not, uh, uh, not, not important at all, uh, not even present. I mean, for instance, the works of the uh, Early, uh, in the early 70s, like the West London Social Resource Project, there was no artist. It's uh, that the artist was not um, present in any way, uh, but there was a work. And uh, so the work was anonymous in a way. It was created by the people involved with it. And um, those people were in a relationship. And the relationship was complex, and it was based in time. And there was uh, really nothing, no, no object, no, no property. I mean, it's interesting, here we are in this, um, in this art fair, a world of objects, a world of possessions, a world of property. But in a way, I would say that was all last century thinking. We're moving into another way of looking, and if we look at the idea of art in the future, in... Um, you know, in the urban culture, uh, I think we will see that, uh, uh, that this, this new practice will uh, have less and less to do with these uh, monuments, the idea of immortality, these things from the past. Um, yes, yeah, so um, this, uh, this is, uh, gives me, this is some of the basis of the, the work that um, of my thinking at the moment. Um, but interestingly, I was uh, talking about with these architects, you might be interested in this project from uh, Cognition Control from the early 1970s, where a group of uh, artists, we had a lot of discussions about how we could kind of change the meaning and function of art practice in society. And we decided that what we would, we would look at the, how the practice could engage with the infrastructure of society. Instead of the artwork being present with an institutional situation, we would engage with the social behavior of people. And that we would set up a kind of, um, we were like, what we were interested in, I think, was a kind of mutualism. But the, this idea of the artist as genius, you know, forget about that. The idea is that actually reality is created by yourself. 
is a cognitive uh, construction and that we're living in a culture and this culture is a construction and it can be different and it can change and it is changing but it's not changing maybe with manifestos it's, if, it's just changing I can tell you how it's changing uh, it comes from actually from engineering a lot to do with engineering but um, this uh, so this project uh, might be, a, yeah. So some 20 artists, they went to the city of Nottingham and they, the idea was to implement these uh, projects simultaneously. So it really would affect the life of the city. Now one project that ref is interesting to hear from this uh, project from Japan and so on, was this uh, uh, Dissimer Bill. This was a, a work that was developed uh, with myself and uh, David Bugden. This was uh, the idea of an Arctic truck in which would be constructed four representations of social control mechanisms. And one of these was to do with fantasy projection. And the idea here was that there was a computer terminal and the person would come in and they would load the program with aspects of themselves. And then they would try to construct a house. And this house would, as they constructed the house, it would show the effects of what they did on themselves and their relationship with other people. Um, this then, this, uh, in the, the, the product of each individual was then collectively looked at in terms of a consensus. Um, this was very early, very primitive <laughs> line drawings and things like that. Other projects involved uh, the, the idea of the tennis project. I don't know if people know about that, but the idea of reorganizing the game of tennis um, another project involved a milk, milk round, changing the way people uh, looked at the milk bottle. Uh, the um, Secret Society of the Masons was another project. So this was uh, a very early attempt, um, interestingly enough, ignored totally by the conventional art world, but picked up by the Financial Times, of all people, who <laughs> reviewed it, the only people to really review it, except from one Swiss critic who came from Basel, of all places, who, who, who wrote a piece about it. Uh, was a pioneer, <laughs> I think, to write about this project. But um, what was interesting about this, though the, I'm just going to f finish, because I can carry on forever. Uh, what, what uh, the interesting thing about what I've just said is really that, um, it, the projects varied absolutely from conventional art practice of that time, more or less. There were a few conceptual artists we would know of in Europe that were thinking along uh, lines like theory should precede practice and so on and so forth. Um, but as a complete statement in a, com in a city like that involving, you know, probably thousands of people, this was really a considerable thing. But totally ignored by the conventional art world, but because each project was participatory and involved the um, voluntary cooperation of other people, in other words, they would only do it if they saw something in it, was a massive, uh, had a massive effect on, the, on, on life in that city. Thank you very much, Stephen. One, I mean, there are many, many follow-up questions. One thing I wanted to ask you is, when we did this uh, uh, interview earlier this year and last year, we discussed uh, sort of notions of uh, self-organization. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting because it's something which popped up, I think, in all the speeches this morning, is uh, self-organization. And obviously, at the moment when you started in the, f in the late 50s, uh, early 60s, was also the moment when Cedric Price started. It's exactly that moment in England, and he defining the non-plan, and this idea of self-organization became very important in, in, uh, in urbanism. There was, it was also the moment of cybernetics. I once interviewed Heinz von Förster, and he told me about feedback loops and, and all of these things. So I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the connection to self-organization, the connection maybe also to cybernetics, and if, for example, there was a link to Cedric Price at that time. Well, I think inevitably there was, but uh, I, um, uh, I came at, as I say, came at this in quite a different way. I came through uh, my connection with systems research and system simulation, yeah. Um, but uh, of which Cedric Price was, of course, interested in what was going on there, yeah. 
Um, yeah, the, 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 pro, the, the concept of self-organization, I think, is uh, as defined by Ross Ashby or, uh, and uh, developed by people like Gordon Pask uh, and Minsky and people, McGluck and people like that. It was immensely important in defining this, um, in this movement into this uh, 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 new cognitive, well, I say new, but evolving cognitive approach to, to reality. Um, they, it was really, but they defined another idea about uh, control, which again had um, all kinds of ramifications for uh, so social, uh, uh, social, even political ideologies. Um, they saw that there was one model where one, you have the idea of the determinism, you know, the idea that one system determines another. It's, uh, there's a hierarchy of relationships, and um, this is uh, based on, um, I mean, it, it could be branching and all the rest of it, but it's, it's really based on you know, an input-output, you know, it's uh, from one thing to another, it, to, it, it's in a chain, shall we say, or a sequence. Well, they defined another idea of control, which was the idea that a system determined it, its own part. Quite, quite different. And um, they saw that such a system would have to have an input-output relationship between all nodes. So instead of having a kind of a, a sequence of one, A, B, C, D, E, F, you know, uh, you, a, B, C, D, E, F would be linked completely and, uh, 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 in, as an input-output effective relationship. So this would enable one or two things, uh, an important thing to happen, that would enable us always to have a zero baseline. So as any input comes into one node, because of the total coupling, all nodes receive that input. So, you know, if one comes in, everything goes to one. Another one comes in, everything goes to two. So there's what we call a floating baseline. And this uh, has the ramification, I mean, one of the ramifications from this is the idea of this, uh, which is very important, the idea of the richness and complexity. The idea that the more variables you have, the more, you know, there, there's a richness and complexity. And, you know, that we, say for instance, we have this, you know, we can be aware that it exists. Uh, we can be aware of its identity its behavior, uh, its material fabric, its mo molecule structure, whatever. Each time you're generating different languages about the same thing. And you're increasing gradually the level of complexity and the level of variables. And uh, so uh, the, the higher the level of resolution, the richer the, the, richer the possibilities. And it's fascinating you mentioned Gordon Pask because Cedric oh, yeah. Price always told me to um, <laughs> to read Gordon Pask and it's kind of forgotten. Oh, unreadable. Now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, well, Gordon Pask was very uh, famous. I mean, there's two people that are very important to my work. One was obviously Gordon Pask because he developed the idea of black box, black box theory, and uh, this was a way of getting round the uh, the fact that they didn't have the facilities to really understand the complexities of what they were doing. So they felt, well, a very convenient way was to put a box on it, and uh, four inputs come in and three come out. So you imagine there's some switching, but all you're concerned with what comes in and what comes out. So they didn't really know what was inside the box. They didn't have the means. It was a modeling tool from the early 60s. And of course, the other is Heinz von Foster, which I'm very much uh, involved with at the moment, and the strange attractor, which is to do with my work in New York. Uh, the idea that... Uh, uh, that uh, things are drawn towards things. I mean, um, we, know, we know they're going somewhere, but we don't really know what they're, where, why or where it's going, but we can use the kinetic en energy of it to generate different levels of resolution in our perception of things. And uh, this is very much to do with this work I'm doing in New York to do with the, the, uh, the idea of data streaming uh, to, to, to streets in New York, one being Delancey Street and the other in Fifth Avenue. And this idea of, for example, mm. remembering Gordon Pask and thinking it could be a toolbox uh, even for now is, I mean, Eric Hobsbawm always says we need a protest against forgetting. And that's my first question actually to uh, all the so speakers. I would be very curious, and maybe we can start with Momoyo, what for you are toolboxes from the past uh, which somehow help you to invent the city of the 21st century? I mean, re I remember once in the 90s when we spoke, you said Shinohara. Mm. Is it still Shinohara? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> 
Sorry. You mean the reference? Yeah, kind references. Of, yeah, yeah, references. Um, yeah, I think uh, the city itself, for example, then Tokyo, what we can see that in observation of the city is a, is a very big toolbox, I think, for us. And also the yeah, former no, big architect or artist, too. So we can find a lot of interesting so, idea what they did. And then, well, for example, Shinohara is uh, one of our referential, <laughs> referential so architect. Uh, he was uh, our kind of our grandpa professor, yeah? and, uh, my, uh, and also the, my uh, father professor, <laughs> is, uh, he is uh, Kazunari Sakamoto. And then, uh, in Tokyo Tech, uh, the, there is a good stream, uh, the relation between the architect and architect. And then we, uh, they are always thinking about the kind of social language of the architecture. And then uh, Shinohara proposed the full uh, style, and then it related to the, for example, first it's uh, analyzing about the, the uh, Japanese traditional element or the Japanese traditional so symbolic uh, the, uh, physical element, for example, land or roof or window, etc., and uh, how related to bring the um, the a new um, a kind of so re revitalize this kind of the uh, traditional or that traditional Japanese uh, element of the architecture or language of the architecture, and um, <coughs> why he wanted to start this point because at the moment is a uh, Japan uh, after World War II, so Japanese people uh, wanted to change a lot to be more modernized the. Uh, modern life, we call. And then in that case, for example, we learn a lot of the, from American culture, and then everybody wanted to have a kind of dream house. But uh, instead of that point, the Shinohara proposal, the, well, going back to the kind of the um, heart of the, or meaning of the traditional one, the, what we can, what they can uh, bring the, some good sense uh, to the future. And then, um, at that point, um, for example, the similar situation, the Kazunari uh, Sakamoto, my professor, the, he was born in, uh, born, he graduated in the suburban city. The, and then suburban city, uh, the Tokyo, uh, is a, at the moment, the uh, original the suburban area is a farmer's village, but uh, it started to be more, uh, I don't know, uh, Higher, uh, uh, to, sorry, um, dense, higher dense, dense is a situation, and then there are a lot of the new house coming. So that he tried to find a kind of a typological way to how negotiate the new urban, the suburban house and the Japanese traditional house house type. So that I think that's also the very good. Uh, they have also very good conversation between the kind of so. Uh, local or uh, traditional or uh, more somehow so consumptional new new commercial so house makers house for example so um, uh, always uh, what we try to find uh, the in the future uh, like a toolbox we can observe the toolbox the history or background or uh, social language etc and then try to find as uh, a kind of new language or a nicer, better language <laughs> for making the new uh, social structures. And if it's for you, Sakamoto, or Shinohara, and for Stephen, mentioned Garden Pass, Luke, what would be your uh, references, toolboxes from the past which help you <coughs> invent the city of the 21st century? Uh, of course, Corbu, uh, because he was the first, I think, who he, he reinvented uh, urbanism. He was the first who... I was very influenced by his project uh, uh, in Algiers, Plan Urbus, where he make, made a total structure, and inside that structure, everybody was free to organize his thing. What's, uh, and what's uh, the most important on that, uh, of course, that's a good idea, but that the input 
of uh, the inhabitants uh, enriched more uh, the, the, the big structure. And uh, yeah, Marcel Duchamp, uh, the unconsciousness, uh, 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 the project that writes itself, and uh, the artist or uh, designer who see uh, growing uh, the project uh, before his eyes. And I always, I have always the feeling that uh, the projects of Top Office, but uh, it's are not my projects, the projects of Top Office, uh, are projects, the, and Top Office is only uh, a medium uh, and where uh, things uh, flow through. That's, uh, and for the rest, uh, not in the pot, yeah, ships and planes. <laughs> and containers also. Yeah. Because right? <laughs> Cedric Price always said, we once had an architecture tour you know, through Helsinki, and the government and everybody else had arranged for the whole group to visit all the masterpieces and Alba Alto, etc. And Cedric kidnapped the bus and took us to see the container <laughs> city, and that's something which plays a role for you also, no? Yeah. Um, yeah, on, on uh, different levels, in fact. Uh, first of all, um, I think architecture and urbanism is not in the first place a, a building, but I think architecture and urbanism is in between the ears. Uh, it's a concept, I think. Uh, it's more spiritual than material. Uh, <coughs> That's one thing, and yeah. Uh, so uh, I don't like to construct very much. I think uh, there is uh, already too much architecture in the world. I think uh, that, that that's personal thing. So uh, I, I I love more to make concepts than uh, buildings. That's uh, one thing, and uh, that's that. For I thought. Containers are very nice because you make a construction for three months and afterwards it became containers. Uh, it's strange that my first uh, project with uh, containers was in Basel in 83, I think. It's a coincidence. <laughs> but uh, also, uh, I used containers because it's very easy uh, when you are an architect to build, build uh, make things with containers. It's very easy. They are conceived to uh, to put together on ships and so on and so on. Uh, but what's also very important uh, uh, that is that for me a container is in fact uh, a symbol for uh, globalization and for uh, urban space. And Henri, who would be your sort of heroes or influences thinking about these projects about the city? Who would be your Shinohara or Gordon Pask or Corbusier? Well, I think, like Andrew was saying, that I come with a, from an experience where the surroundings change faster than the tools. So I do not have this uh, relation, like one one to relation to the efficiency of a tool. But there is one thing, for example, which I've always uh, um, inspired me, although it might be just a story, is how when the amplifier was invented, like the, the, the sound instrument, and when it was invented, they heard of about its invention in, in Russia too. So they invented one based only on the rumors they heard about. Which I, and I always thought this very interesting when, when a tool, which is the one that is is uh, is there to amplify sounds was itself based on uh, its its own construction was based on rumors of it being built somewhere else. So I think this is more my 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 relation to to tools. And one of the things which was brought up before is obviously the question of the the manifesto. And if we look at past, you know models of, of, of urbanism, there has always been manifestos, the Corbusier uh, idea of the manifesto, and I mean, Shinohara also had type of manifesto. Um, and Steve, you expressed a certain doubt about manifestos. We did a manifesto marathon in London where you presented a, yeah, a manifesto for, for, for our time, uh, yet also many of the participants in that marathon expressed actually doubts about manifesto. Tino Segal said, 
manifestos are very masculine, they're very loud, they're very 20th century, maybe the 21st century is more a conversation. So I was very curious thinking about the city, and it's a question to the four of you, maybe we start with Stephen. Um, do you have manifestos? Uh, well, I, 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 I uh, issued manifestos um, uh, quite early on, I suppose, but in my, my work in 61. Um, and the role of, and then the role I saw of the manifesto was to define a territory of thinking before an event. So I felt that if you varied the, uh, the you know, varied, uh, 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 moved away from existing norms uh, tangentially, you know, you needed to create a climate of reception. And in a way, the manifesto was a, a means of proclaiming uh, something to creating this. Uh, this climate uh, uh, of reception in advance of the actual activity. So I, I went around to um, private views giving out these manifestos, which were uh, a critique of uh, the existing practice you know, that I, we'd inherited from the 1950s and 1940s. But then, of course, uh, this also is a, <laughs> again, we talk about last century thinking in a way. I saw that in the world we're in at the moment, the, yeah, the manifesto, it's uh, it's not necessary because um, you know you could, you're in a dialogue. This is the the new and another relationship. You know you you can uh, set up uh, uh, through um, more um, uh, yeah through dialogue. You can create the same climate. And um, yeah, I thought it was redundant. That's why I made this contribution <laughs> to your manifesto. Thing. And Andre, what about your manifestos? Uh, I agree. I also think that we live in a no manifesto, no cry period. <laughs> no. Mm -hmm. And Luke? Uh, yeah, I wrote a manifesto uh, in, in the 80, I think, uh, or in urbanism, but I think the tune was a little bit ironical. <laughs> Momoyo? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so the manifesto, mani ma manifesto is a uh, Really, yeah, it's it's not uh, easy to say the manifesto now. I think uh, so. Everybody, so the uh, word is not so easy and not so simply. So uh, I think uh, from my point of view, it's really difficult to say. So what is the goal? Um, like for for example, the recently Japan had a big earthquake, and then so we had a lot of new problem. So to the society, so nuclear things and electric, and also the tsunami, etc. And uh, actually, it's a recently, so we lost a lot of the landscape. So that from that point, of lack of the landscape, uh, what we can um, establish the society, and uh, what we can do for the people. So um, it's a really big question <laughs> for everybody. So I think. Um, my next, my this century, so maybe, so we have to think about uh, what we can do. So, and, and then I think uh, actually the government or, and a lot of people already understand, so we cannot uh, do the same way as the 20th century. Um, I think we have to think about the kind of, instead of the high wall, like a, a high wall was already damaged by the tsunami, so we cannot replace the same way, so we need more, not higher wall, <laughs> more than the, so communication with the people and society. So I think we need uh, some another strategy to establish the 21st century people. And if it's no manifesto, no cry, and that is my <laughs> very last question, uh, and if there is no manifestos, there might be dreams. And uh, I was reading this morning this list of look of all the unrealized kind of projects and proposals, and it really made me dream. It's uh, proposals for horticulture on the roofs. There are proposals for the use of force biologique. There are the proposals to adopt leisure activities. It's a very, very long list. Um, so I was wondering if you can tell us about your unrealized projects for cities. I mean, do you have, it's, it leads a kind of a complex question, because I was the other day uh, uh, recording an interview with Norman Foster and, and Oscar Niemeyer, and they both discussed this idea of inventing a city from scratch, no? which is obviously one aspect of urbanism. Uh, Oscar told us about Brasilia, and he said he would build Brasilia very differently if he would build it again today. 
you know, Norman Foster spoke about his uh, uh, ecological sustainable city uh, near Abu Dhabi, uh, and they compared these two different cities. Um, and then the discussion also led to the idea that actually many, many cities obviously grow in layers. They are not invented from scratch. But to cut the long, long story short, I was curious if you had any uh, unrealized cities you wanted to build or any unrealized projects for cities or dreams. Maybe we start with Stephen. Oh, okay. Well, uh, well yeah, well, many. But uh, I think that, uh, the, uh, that uh, what is unrealized in a way is, is uh, of is the uh, the idea of um, people determining their own reality? I mean, this is uh, this is the important, uh, important, and a, you know, the important. I say cognitive development. In a way, it's interesting. You're in a kind of um, you're in a kind of uh, uh, kind of polarity. You know, at the moment, you have a culture that's hanging on to the idea of objects and property and possessions. And then on the other hand, you have something driving forward that's talking about fluidity, complexity, and transience, and um, the idea of self-organization, and, and so on. So you have this kind of, I see a kind of polarity between objects and people. And I see in a way that the urban reality that we exist in is determined by the notion that in the end of objects, that actually it's people, it's society that should determine the reality that we're in. But that society itself is determined in terms of a struggle between different models of control within it. So the, obviously the, situ the situation is, is complex. But if I had an unrealized dream for thinking uh, about the idea of uh, the, uh, I would go back in a way to the glue snivers in the, in the wastelands of West London, who uh, left their uh, people living in these, um, uh, these, these housing blocks which had been created by architects. Paternalistic socialism of the, li of the late 60s, they, they, what, they thought they were doing good things for people, but they created uh, a concrete, uh, concrete prison for people to be in, but the, they, which as society stigmatized these uh, environments, people felt more and more unhappy about their situation there. But they didn't give up. They found ways to establish their own society within that uh, you know, inhibitory kind of world they were in. And the young kids, they went off into the wastelands that surround West London, these void spaces you're talking about. And in it, they created their own camps. They created their own structures. And uh, within the structures, they were hidden from the world outside. So they could do what they wanted in these structures. They were in the bushes, uh, in the places no one ever went. And I thought, well, that is the basic human spirit of self-organization, of transformation, and ultimately of creativity. Henri, what's your dream? Well, it's, it's, it has a contradiction because it, uh, I started saying that it's, to me, urbanism is uh, dealing with this gray zone, which is between what is useful and what could and the effects about things. And at the same time, the contradiction is that at the same time that I, I'm interested in narrowing, I still hope it never narrows, because then one stops dreaming about a, a different city. And look. Yeah. The dreams are left as dreams, I think. Momoyo? <laughs> <laughs> um, a library, lively space uh, by, the pe by the people. A self-organized library. Um. Mm, so the li li lively, lively, so that, yeah, self-organized and, and uh, so they activate the people's uh, life, I think. That is good. There could not be a more wonderful conclusion. I'm, no, I'm not sure, Claudio, will tell us if we can now <laughs> take questions or if you're running out of time, because if you're running out of time, then we can take questions individually. We can take a few questions. Are there urgent questions from the floor for our speakers? No questions? 
Oh, as Henri would say, no questions, no cry. <laughs> 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 you no, know, if there is no question, I've got a last question. Uh. Uh, <laughs> Rainer Maria Rilke wrote uh, a lovely little book, um, and it's an advice to a young artist, and um, kind of wondering what in uh, 2011 uh, would be your advice to a young <laughs> urbanist artist or artist urbanist? Momo Young. Yeah, it's very difficult, but the visit the place, uh, I think, then talk to people. So they're getting the more directly experience, I think. It's a very good for thinking. And Luke? Yeah, it's very difficult uh, to answer. Can you can you repeat the question? Yeah, Rainer Maria <laughs> Rilke wrote this, you know, yeah. little book, and it's an advice to a young poet. And oh I yeah. mean, you know, I see there are also so lots of students here, and so yes. I was kind of thinking, you know, what would be your advice to uh, a young uh, urbanist or, or artist, if there can be? Yeah, I think that uh, thoughts are very uh, important, but that every thought is not to be realized. Uh, I'll give an example. Uh, communism is quite nice when it's not realized. Capitalism should be very nice when, it's, when it should not be realized. <laughs> <laughs> and Henri? You gave me a gray hair because I thought I was still young. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, I, would, I would say in terms of speaking of tools and spe speaking of each tool it comes with its own syntax that to be at the same time very, very um, attentive to the syntax and nevertheless not try to reach the highest efficiency with them. Wait, and Stephen? Oh, I don't know. I would say walk the streets and uh, look at, think about the functionality of what you might be doing in those streets. Thank you so very much. Many, many thanks to Momoyo, to Luke, to Andre, to Steve, and to all of you for coming. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks.